you for the opportunity to present today. Um, as you heard, my name is Abby Douglas and I am a Location Data Analyst at Tuikuti Te Whenua Land Information New Zealand. Um, at LINS, I work in the Elevation team, um, so my main role is uh, quality checking LiDAR data. Um, so most of our process, the QC process that we've developed, has been uh, using open source software. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the different tools that we've, we've used to create our, our steps. Um, we also do some visualizations in which we also um, create using open source software. Um, so this is an example up here. It's of um, Auckland CBD and that 3D effect is because of the elevation data underneath. Um, so I'll go through some of that a little bit later in the presentation. Cool, so we mainly get our LIDAR through the National Elevation Program, which began in 2016. Um, it's a partnership program between LINs and councils to procure and make publicly available a nationally consistent, high quality baseline elevation data set for New Zealand. Cool, so by 2024, 80% of the country will be covered with elevation data. So currently we're at about 30%. Cool, so the image on the left is a derived product of LIDAR and the image on the right is aerial imagery and this, uh, they're the same extents of the Manawatu River in Palmerston North and it just shows really nicely the difference that you get between the two products and how much more detail um, and information you can get from LIDAR. Cool, so we've heard quite a bit about LIDAR today, um, but what is it? Uh, cool, so it, st it stands for Light Detention and Ranging. It is captured from an active laser sensor that is mounted on an aircraft. So as the aircraft flies over the landscape, the sensor sends out laser pulses that reflect off of the surface features back to the sensor. So the image in the middle there shows you um, then an example of what the light signature that gets um, returned to the sensor looks like. And you can see that one pulse actually returns multiple points. So the image on the right, when there's multiple points in the 3D space, it's termed a point cloud. So this is another example of a point cloud. Um, each point has multiple attributes. Um, so this has been symbolized by classification. Um, and that is where each color represents a different surface feature. So the buildings are, are cream, the ground is orange, and the, the vegetation is kind of yellow. Um, and the point clouds in the National Elevation Program are distributed to the public through open topography. So there are two raster products as well that are derived from the point cloud data. So this is the first one, this is a digital elevation model and it's been created from the ground points only. So it's a bare earth model. The second is a digital surface model um, and that has been created using all points except noise. Um, so, uh, sorry, so it includes features that are above the ground, such as vegetation and buildings. Cool, and so you can get both um, raster products available on the LDS, which I'm sure you all know about. <laughs> um, and those blue polygons are the current data sets that we've got available at the moment. Cool, so the LiDAR that we get is tiled to 1 to 1K tile index. Um, so for regional scale data sets, uh, we typically get kind of five to 10,000 tiles, but we can get up to 40,000 tiles. So our QCIS process can be done manually um, through spot checking, but with big regional scale data sets, we often miss a lot of issues. So um, creating some uh, scripts has allowed us to check over every tile in the data set so that we can be confident on whether it passes or fails. So this slide is basically all the software that we use during our QC process. Um, you can see the ones with the asterisks are all open source. So majority of the, the software that we use is open source. Um, we, our scripts are written in Python, um, so we run them through Anaconda um, and we have a GitHub repository that stores all our scripts. So I'm going to talk about LAS tools, PDAL, and GDAL next. 
tool. So Les Tools is a suite of tools for processing and analyzing point clouds. Um, it's really easy to install. You just download a zip file and all of the tools are in the zip file. Um, and you can just um, access those through command line. Um, Les Tools has become quite an industry standard software suite for processing LiDAR data, largely because of how efficiently it can process billions of points. However, there's a limit on the number of points that it will freely process. Um, so I think it's about 3 million. Don't quote me on that though. Um, yeah. So there are some tools that it doesn't matter how many points um, that it will process. And one of those is Les Info. Uh, so Les Info, it prints header metadata and summary of the point data uh, per file to like a text file or to the, the terminal. Um, so on the left is some information that you'd get in the header. Um, for example, the LAS version, the file created, the number of points, um, the projection information, etc. And then on the right there, um, you can see that it, LAS tools actually reads the point data and then it will give you a minimum and a maximum value for a, a bunch of, of attributes. Um, so some of those attributes are like the X, Y, Z coordinate, um, the intensity, return number, GPS time, uh, classification, and then also the number of points per classification, which is really handy. So we use LAS tools in our biggest script. Um, so it creates a LAS info report for all of the tiles in the data set. Um, and then it summarizes all that information to terminal um, as to whether it's correct or incorrect based on our parameters. And then if it's incorrect, it creates a, a list of tiles that have that issue. Um, and this is a really incredible uh, script that we run. We run it at the very start of our QC process. And I had, I think it was like a couple of weeks ago, I had a data set that had 9,000 tiles. Um, and it came back that there was one point in one last file that had no GPS time and no return number and the script picked it up. So it's really comprehensive um, and yeah, it, it, it gives us confidence that every point cloud tile meets that minimum requirement. So, excuse me for a minute. Cool, GDAO, which I, I think most of you have heard of before. Um, it is specifically for raster and vector formats. So we use it for the DEM and the DSM um, QC process. We install it through Anaconda um, and access it through command line and scripts. Um, it is a common library to use, so it's got pretty good documentation online. Um, and it also has a LAS info equivalent, so it's called GDAL um, info. And what that does is it reads the tag information of a raster file um, and prints it to terminal. Um, so we use this tool in, in a script to go through all of the, the tiles, get the information, see whether it's correct or incorrect. Um, we, a couple of errors that we generally find is like incorrect tiling, incorrect no data value, um, wrong georeferencing, etc. But what I want to talk to you about is GDAL build VRT and GDAL adder. So GDAL build VRT creates a virtual raster. A virtual raster is a text file which stores information about the TIFFs in your data set. Um, so that information is like the file location, no data value, um, file size, data types, etc. When the VRT is loaded into GA software, um, it's treated as a raster and it only displays the TIFFs in the window. So this is some, some snippets from the code that we have. Um, so the top uh, image is like your general arguments that you'd use to run GDAL build VRT. Um, one of the things we found is that when we have really, really big scripts, um, it, whether we create a VRT or not, it generally slows down a lot when we load it into um, QGIS and pan around the data set, etc. So there are two things that we have created in the script that help speed up the efficiency of the VRT. So the first one is child VRTs. Um, so that's the bottom image. So for every 300 TIFF files, we create one VRT and we call them the children VRT. Um, and then we create a main VRT of the children's. 
basically what it means is when you load the master into QGIS, it doesn't have to load as much information because it's only loading the information of where the child VRTs are. So it, it, it loads faster, basically. Um, the other thing is creating um, overviews, and that's the one up on the, the far side. Um, it, it creates it using GDAL Edo, and basically what an overview is, is it creates lower resolution imagery at, or uh, data at different zoom levels. So when you're at the tile extent, you're seeing the original data, and then as you start to zoom up, it gets replaced with lower resolution um, data. And so what that means is when you're at your full scale data set access, um, you are you're, it's only processing a low amount of information so that it's easier to pan around the data set, etc. So these two uh, things have been incredible for this, for this script because it means that we can load in a really big data set. It takes a couple of seconds. You can zoom around it. It's really quick. And it, it allows us to do a visual check on the whole data set for artifacts and the DEM and DSM really efficiently. Cool. PDAL. Um, this is the last script that I want to talk to you about, um, and it uses a, a PDAL tool. Um, PDAL is similar to LAS tools. It's a software suite for LiDAR processing, mainly the point clouds, which is why it starts with P. Um, but it's like GDAL in the sense that you install it through Anaconda, um, and it has a set number of programs that can be run via command line, and they're the other ones on the far left. Um, so, for example, the PDAL merge is amazing to merge a lot, lots of point cloud data uh, tiles together. But the one I want to talk about is pipeline. So, what the pipeline tool does is you can input a JSON file, uh, sorry, a LAS file into the pipeline, do a bunch of stuff with it, and then you output one file. And so the bunch of stuff you do with a lot of, with the filters, which is that middle image. And there's an example on the far side of what the pipeline actually looks like. So it's a JSON file, um, which you, you run, you can call in command line to, to run. And it, so this example specifically, um, it adds RGB values to the LAS tool, uh, to the LAS files. So, you just to briefly explain what it does, you add in your uh, it inputs the LAS file using uh, the input dot LAS, and then the first two filters dot outline filters dot range just removes any noise in the in the LAS file, um, and then your filters dot colorization. That is what actually adds your RGB values from input imagery to your point cloud. And then because a bunch of imagery usually has no data values, that last filter start range removes any points that have no, the wrong value um, for RGB. And then it outputs your LAS file. And so the, the key with, with PDAL, uh, with pipeline, is that you don't have any intermediate files while you're doing your processing. So it, it processes a lot faster. Cool. So we, we use um, a, a PDAL pipeline to create density scripts. So at the moment, there's not really any option like a VRT where you can look at all of your, your point cloud data at once, um, which I think is something that's happening with the development with the new QGIS stuff, which will be really interesting. Um, but at the moment, what we do is we create density scripts. So the top image there is the pipeline that we use. So we input using a readers.las the, the LAS file, and then we use this writers.gdal, which essentially creates a, a raster where the pixel values are the count of the, the number of points. Um, and so we, I could, we could use a filters.range here to filter the, the LAS file, but writer.gdal actually has its own filter in the where statement. So the image below shows you a couple of examples of those where statements. Um, so if you were wanting just a ground density raster, you would use the, the first where statement filter where it just filters everything but points that are classified as two. 
we run the script in a multi-processing environment so that we can run eight tiles at a time, speeds it up significantly, um, and then we create a VRT out of the rasters so we can zoom around the data set. So this is an example of a ground density output. Um, so you can see that the blue pixels have really low ground points and then the red and the yellows and the greens have higher ground points. And you start to see this pattern. So the, the black lines are your flight lines. And so you can see that at the edges of a swath, the ground density is a lot lower than it is directly under the plane, which makes sense. But this is a kind of artifact that we want to make sure is not in the DEM. Um, so that is something that we would look at if we see this in the ground density raster. Another thing we look at is voids. So if there are voids over, um, over surface features such as like rivers and, and buildings and trees, that's fine. Um, if there is a void over what should be bare earth or ground, then that's something that we look at further. So the one that I'm pointing out there is a void and it's because it's been classified as low vegetation instead of ground. Um, and in this case, it doesn't cause any artifacts in the DEM, so it's fine. But that's, that's the reason why we do these, these density checks. Cool. So now I just want to talk a little bit about um, visualizations because once a data set has been published, we create um, a visualization to try and promote the data set. So we use open source software to do this, um, and here are a couple of examples. So Aerial OD is a voxel-based program um, for 3D applications. It was created by Magica Voxel, and it's really good for our PC process because you can see artifacts really well in 3D. Um, but it's also really cool for visualizations. So you can see how like, it's kind of boxy and Minecrafty, and that's because of the voxels. Um, and this is the Christchurch high density data set. As you start to zoom out though, um, you lose those boxes and if you play with the shadow and the, light, the lighting, you start to develop quite model-like um, visualizations, which is really cool. And this is the West Coast data set that's just been published. We also use Blender, um, which is a computer graphics software for 3D applications. Um, my colleague a couple of months ago figured out how to render point clouds in Blender, um, which is epic. Um, and so we found out that because Les files are so big, you can only render small scenes. But if you pick the right scene, it looks really incredible. Um, so this is from the Heart City data set. Um, it looks like some sort of power plant, which is really cool. Maybe. <laughs> cool, and so you can also do raster work in Blender. Um, so this is a series of different hill shades um, that have been um, underlain uh, or overlain with imagery and you can see that the way that it's been done with the lighting and stuff makes it look like you can see individual trees, which is really cool. QGIS also has some great visualisation capabilities um, and uh, specifically in the relief visualisation toolbox. Um, so that's how you can create all those different types of hill shades. So this is a very similar method to before, but you can see this is from Wellington and it just really makes that beehive pop out, which is really cool. This is a relative elevation model. Um, I won't go into what that is, but um, I've used about five or six different layers for this visualization and QGIS has some really nice blending techniques, um, which is really cool. So I used lots of different layers so that we can um, kind of pick out different areas and highlight different things in the, in the image. And then this is the last one. This is um, Cloud Compare, which is a really good processing and display capability software uh, for point clouds, <coughs> sorry, specifically. So this is the Whanganui um, data set. I ran this through the pipeline that I explained um, a couple of minutes ago to create, um, to add those RGB values to the point cloud, and then I displayed it in Cloud Compare. Um, yeah, which is cool. It looks like a really poor, like bad resolution image, <laughs> but it's actually points. <laughs> cool, so if you were really interested in um, all of those visualizations that we just created, or if you wanted to learn about 
uh, what a relative elevation model is, um, you can go to our website, which is um, Elevation Aotearoa, and we have a bunch of how-to guides for open source software. Um, so yeah, you can learn about all the different types of hill shades, you could do your own colorizing points, um, you could learn about shadows, yeah, there's, there's heaps there and we're adding to it as we, we learn as well. Also on that website is a tab for the dataset availability and release schedule. Um, so the green uh, polygons are the, the datasets that are available, the orange are currently going through our QC process. We do have estimates on when it might be published for the orange polygons, but it depends on what we find during QC as to whether it gets pushed out or not. Um, and then the yellow is still being captured and processed by the survey companies. And lastly, um, we also post on Twitter. Um, so our Twitter handle is LinsLDS, um, and every time we publish a data set, we post on Twitter with a really nice visualization. So if you want to keep up that way, um, yeah, I, I recommend. We're getting more creative with our visualizations. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, real quick, um, when do you think you're going to start releasing the point clouds to the survey companies? I know they're on open Topo now, but probably that's a much better platform. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, we've got a piece of work at the moment that is um, starting that development with the LDS. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much I can say about it, um, but it is going well. <laughs> so it's hopefully something that we can have in the future, definitely. We do it locally at the moment. Um, we do have plans to go to the cloud. Um, so at the moment, um, our team's been working on the aerial imagery side of it, getting into the cloud, um, and then we're next. So I've been go slowly going through all the scripts and making sure that they um, are optimized for cloud processing, um, which we had quite a few plugins and stuff that we were using, which was great, but um, we can't use those if we do cloud processing, so yeah. Mm -hmm. I worked with Lava Datasets in the past uh, where I couldn't use the intensity rating of the sun. Is that something you do in the quality assessment at all? Yeah. Yeah, so we make sure that the intensity has been um, normalized across the data set so that not some individual tiles, so that's like it's like between zero and 65,000. Um, and that's kind of all we check really just to make sure that that's, that's accurate. The pyramiding from the uh, cloud GIS and things. Mm -hmm. At what level did the pyramiding actually get applied? Was that the like? It was at the, the uh, it was at the, the master, so the last thing that um, gets created. So on the parent. So the parent, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Um, you can do it on the child's as well. Depends on um, how fast you want it to go. But the overviews is actually the, the main thing that makes the VRTs so much faster. Um, yeah, really worth it. Cool. Thank you.